Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. And these SALT talks, it's an acronym for seminars about long-term thinking. Most of the time, we're kind of focusing on the long-term part. Um, tonight's about thinking. And uh, one of the people who has done the most thinking about thinking in the most realistic and productive way is our speaker, Julia Galef. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here uh, for several reasons, actually. First, I've been a fan of the Long Now Foundation for a long time. Um, but there's this other reason I'm excited to be here, which is that I frequently get people asking me my origin story, like, how did I get interested in this topic, thinking about thinking, as Stuart so perfectly put it. Um, why is this you know, exciting or interesting to me? And I, I always hesitate, because the true answer is going to sound pretty weird. And, uh, and so I, I'm never quite sure whether to, whether to give it or not. But all of you are here with the long now. And, uh, and Long Now is an organization that adds extra digits to dates and builds indestructible clocks. Um, and it's just generally kind of weird in the best possible way. <laughs> so I'm hoping that you guys might be sufficiently weird that I can just tell you my true motivation for uh, being interested in this topic. So here it is. <clears throat> um, when I was a child, I was very uh, enamored of science fiction and fantasy novels and TV and movies. Um, and there was this one particular trope that I found enthralling and moving. Um, and I, I didn't know that it had a name at the time. I guess it didn't have a name at the time. But uh, as I got older, years later, I found the perfect name for it in a, a book by Keith Stanovich called The Robot's Rebellion. So this trope is it's a trope of self-determination. Um, these are stories of some creature, like a, a robot or a clone or Frankenstein's monster, that uh, was created for some purpose. Um, and in the story, the creature achieves self-awareness and comes to learn or, or comes to understand how and why it was created, what purpose it was meant to serve. And it wrestles with the knowledge, which is sometimes upsetting or bittersweet. Um, and then sometimes it decides to go chart its own path. Um, you know, the robot decides, you know what? I'm not going to be a soldier or a sex bot. I'm going to try to create a new life for myself that you know, I enjoy and that's fulfilling to me, that I care about. Um, and then the insight that I got from The Robot's Rebellion and other books like The Selfish Gene is that this is also our story. This is the story of humanity. We are essentially robots. We are survival machines created by our genes for the purpose of making copies of those genes. And our genes don't care about us as individuals. Um, for their purposes, we should ideally be spending our lives always hungry for more resources, hungry for more status, have a bunch of babies, um, and then die when we're no longer useful. Which is a sobering thing to realize and wrestle with about our own existence. But having realized it, we can choose to rebel. We can say, you know what? We're going to invent things like the birth control pill, because even though it may serve our genes' goals for us to be constantly pregnant, those aren't our goals as individuals. And the same is true of our minds. We're starting to understand the ways that our minds are poorly designed for our goals as people um, and the societies that we create. And we're starting to ask, OK, what should we do about it? And this is a debate that has stretched out for centuries um, and has really heated up in the last few decades. So I'm going to give you a super fast, grossly oversimplified uh, summary of this debate. <clears throat> First, man is a rational animal, say historical philosophers and classical economists. Actually, we're pretty irrational, say <laughs> cognitive scientists. Actually, our irrationality is rational after all, say evolutionary psychologists. Actually, it's not, <laughs> says me. <laughs> now, I'm not the only one saying this, I just might be the one saying it loudest and most insistently, um, but there are other people who, to varying degrees, are making the same point. So that's a sneak peek of the debate. And I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so giving you kind of the highlights, um, the most important concepts and arguments in this debate. So originally, we saw ourselves as rational. 
Um, Aristotle famously said something along these lines that man is a rational animal. And the idea was not that people are always perfectly rational, because obviously we do stupid things sometimes, you know, especially if we're upset or angry. But the idea was that we were endowed with a capacity for reason, and that made us fundamentally different in kind from other animals. And that the purpose of that capacity for reason was to achieve truth, to examine our beliefs, um, weigh the logic and the evidence, and come to more accurate conclusions. This is sometimes called the classical or Cartesian view of reasoning after Descartes. Classical economics treats man as a rational animal in a somewhat different sense. Um, that field assumes that people process information optimally um, in order to make the best decision for their preferences. And again, this doesn't mean that people don't sometimes fail at this process because they're upset or distracted or whatever, but at least they're not systematically making irrational choices, is the assumption. So then around the 1960s, cognitive scientists began to show that actually there are a bunch of ways that our reasoning fails, in predictable ways, not just in occasional random ways. And this is Daniel Kahneman, who won a Nobel Prize for documenting some of these uh, systematic reasoning errors, and kickstarted the heuristics and biases field, which you might have read about in books like Thinking Fast and Slow, Predictably Irrational, um, or maybe you've just seen all the lists of cognitive biases floating around the internet, um, like overconfidence or anchoring or the availability heuristic. And there's one especially significant bias, um, really a whole category of biases that I want to point out in particular. It's called directionally motivated reasoning, and it is the unconscious tendency to rely on evidence and arguments that support a preferred conclusion. More colloquially, for desired conclusions, we ask ourselves, can I believe this? And for undesired conclusions, we ask, must I believe this? <laughs> the key to recognize here is that we have a lot of flexibility in how we form our beliefs. And that flexibility gives us a lot of wiggle room, makes it easy for us to have a double standard for things that we want to believe versus things we don't. You know, we can choose which sources we find trustworthy. Um, we can choose whether to keep searching for more evidence or a second opinion or to just stop with what we have currently. I mean, we can choose how high of an evidentiary standard we want to apply to someone's claim. So all of those choices give us a lot of leeway to arrive at whatever conclusion we want. Now, the phrase directionally motivated cognition is not the most catchy term in the world. So I've come to think of this feature in our cognition as a kind of soldier mindset. Um, that's because it's kind of like treating ideas as if they were soldiers on a battlefield with you. Some ideas or arguments are on our side um, and we want to defend them. Other ideas or arguments are uh, a threat, and we want to knock them down or avoid them. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, Julia, is it really fair to use the soldier metaphor? Surely that isn't how most people think about reasoning. If so, I would like to cordially introduce you to the English language, which begs to differ. <laughs> According to our own language, the act of reasoning is a brutal, bloody, take no prisoners war. We shoot down ideas, we, look, uh, we take positions on issues, we look for weaknesses in other people's positions, we defend ideas, we advance arguments, and we concede points, which I realize now is like ceding territory. Um, this is an insight that I got from the book Metaphors We Live By by George Lakoff, and I haven't been able to stop noticing it uh, since then, even in my own language. So you're probably already well acquainted with soldier mindset, especially in some domains like politics, where uh, you can just watch over, over years, short periods of years, factual questions become polarized with time. For example, global warming. A lot of people don't realize that as recently as 20 years ago, this was not a politically divisive issue. Republicans and Democrats basically agreed on whether global warming was happening. And then over the subsequent years, it became this political shibboleth, where it's like an issue where your belief indicates a lot more about you um, than just your best estimate of the scientific question, but rather your values and what tribe you belong to. Um, so the gap between Democrats and Republicans widened about 35 percentage points in one decade. Um, and most of those people, if you ask them, would not say, I believe this about global warming because I'm a Democrat or because I'm a Republican. They would explain their view by citing sources or giving logical reasons. It's just that the decisions about which sources are logic to trust, um, what evidentiary standard to apply, are motivated by political affiliation. Um, so that's a pattern of beliefs becoming more politically polarized. This is a pattern of beliefs becoming reverse politically polarized. <laughs> 10 years ago, Republicans were much more likely to see Russia as a threat. Now it's the reverse, Democrats are more likely. Um, you can probably figure out why. <laughs> Take a 
basic science. Scientists almost always feel like they're, they're objectively pursuing truth, but that doesn't mean that their reasoning isn't being unconsciously motivated by concerns about their reputation, um, their funding sources, their career. And these statistics are from a paper by John Unides, and he and his co-authors found that papers where at least one of the authors was employed by a company that produced the drug being studied were 22 times less likely to report anything negative about the drug. And a similar thing happens to maybe slightly less dramatic degrees um, across all fields, with scientists being motivated to get significant results so that they can get published. Um, and again, a lot of them will just, or nearly all of them, I assume, will sincerely tell you, I'm just trying to do objective science here. And the problem is just that in any study, there are hundreds of little choices you have to make about which hypotheses to test or um, how to test them. You know, what variables should you control for? Should you include this as an outlier or exclude it? Um, there's a ton of room for you to just unconsciously get the result you want by asking yourself, can I believe this? Um, and avoid the results you don't want by asking, must I believe this? There have also been several studies where doctors were asked questions like, if you accepted gifts from a pharmaceutical representative, would that bias your decisions about which drugs to prescribe? And the doctor's answers in these studies are basically, no, but other doctors might be biased. <laughs> And this effect is consistent across all sorts of biases, all sorts of test subjects' domains. We agree that other people are susceptible to bias, just not us. All right, I have one last graph for you about soldier mindset, um, and it is one of the most important slides in this talk. It's also extremely depressing. Are you ready? I call it the graph of despair. Now, it's hard to see, but I don't hear anyone breaking out into sobs, so I'll have to explain why this is so depressing. Um, this is a graph uh, from a paper by Dan Kahan, who studies motivated reasoning at Yale Law School. Uh, and this is, again, a question about, is global warming happening? But the x-axis this time isn't years. It's your level of science intelligence, which Kahan defines as a mixture of scientific knowledge and numeracy, like, do you understand basic math? And the more scientifically literate people are, the more their views are determined by their politics. And the reason this is so depressing is it means we can't just educate our way out of these problems. You know, a lot of people assume that the reason people disagree with each other about global warming is some people just aren't well informed enough. And this result, this graph of despair, uh, just shows how easy it is, how thoroughly you can marshal evidence and logic to defend almost whatever you want, maybe even especially, you know, if you're especially intelligent and clever. And the only solution is to want to get it right, and that's really hard. So to recap, all of that was me expanding on the heuristics and biases movement, um, or at least one major example of it, directionally motivated reasoning. And the next stage in the debate is this one. Actually, irrationality is rational after all. Um, I wrote evolutionary psychologists on the slide, but the people saying this are really a combination of evolutionary psychologists like Robert Kurzban here, um, plus other people in other fields who were influenced by evolutionary psychology like Robin Hansen, who's an economist. Um, and there's also, separately, a chunk of the field of positive psychology saying similar things, which I'll talk about. Now, I know saying irrationality is rational sounds like, you know, a Zen koan or a contradiction, <laughs> um, but it's not because there are two types of rationality, in instrumental and epistemic. So epistemic rationality means forming beliefs, beliefs about the world that are as accurate as possible. Instrumental rationality means behaving in a way that helps you achieve your goals or values. And so the claim of this group of people is that epistemic irrationality is instrumentally rational. In other words, holding false beliefs is often useful. The big Evo psych uh, evolutionary psychology contribution to this grand debate is that we shouldn't expect that the brain evolved to be accurate. You know, just like any feature of any animal, the brain evolved to give us a survival advantage, to increase the probability that we'll pass our genes on to subsequent generations. And sometimes that involves having accurate beliefs. Sometimes it involves having false beliefs. This is an analogy that Kurzban uses in his book, um, Why Everyone Else is a Hypocrite, um, <clears throat> which I highly recommend. <laughs> his analogy is, think of a nest of baby birds. Um, the mama bird spends her time foraging for food, um, and she gets as much as she can, but it's not enough to give unlimited food to every bird. So she prioritizes the babies that are the hungriest, the most in danger of starving. Now, the way that baby birds communicate how hungry they are is by chirping. And if you're one of the babies, your goal is to get as much food as possible. 
even if you're not on the brink of starvation, the more food you get, the more you grow up big and strong and able to thrive. So the best strategy for you is just to chirp as if you're starving, even if you're not. And of course, the strategy is not conscious on the part of the baby birds, um, but it's sort of built into the way evolution shapes how birds work. And evolutionary psychologists argue that there are a lot of equivalent situations for humans where having false beliefs makes you better able to convince other people to give you resources. Sharing your tribe's beliefs, your political or cultural tribe, makes other people in your tribe see you as loyal, trustworthy, likable. Being overly confident that your projects are going to succeed convinces other people that you're worth investing in financially. <laughs> and some evolutionary psychologists have even argued, much less intuitively, that the reason people are irrationally optimistic about their health is because it makes other people more willing to be friends with them. The logic being that people don't want to invest a lot of time and energy in someone who's going to die soon. So <laughs> that one's harder to swallow. And when evolutionary psychologists say that to me, I always sort of squint at their face like, are you serious? But I think they are. Um, anyway, in theory, holding these false beliefs isn't strictly necessary to reap the benefits, right? You could hold accurate beliefs and then just intentionally deceive other people. The problem is just that it's really hard to intentionally deceive other people. Humans have evolved to be really good at picking up on these subtle cues from the way people hold themselves or behave or the tone of their voice. Um, so the logic goes, in order to be convincing, we have to believe it ourselves. So here's a different case for the existence of strategically false beliefs. This, is, this one comes from positive psychology. It's like a subfield of psych psychology. This argument is that it's good to be irrationally optimistic about your life and how great you are, not for the persuasion reason, but as a kind of psychological immune system, um, because it makes you happier, more well-adjusted. And one benefit of that is that it can be a self-fulfilling prophecy. You know, believing you're likely to succeed makes you more motivated, makes you put in more effort, and that in turn makes you actually more likely to succeed. There have been hundreds of articles making points like this, and nearly all of them can be traced back to a single paper in the psychology literature from 1988. It's called Illusion and Well-Being, a Social Psychological Perspective by Shelley Taylor and Jordan, uh, Jonathan Brown. It's one of the most cited papers of all time in the psych literature, and it's basically a review of a bunch of other papers which, according to Taylor and Brown, show that we must view the psychologically healthy person not as someone who sees things as they are, but as someone who sees things as he or she would like them to be. As you can probably tell, I'm not fully convinced, um, and I'll go into more detail on this research later in the talk. It's actually pretty hilarious. <clears throat> but first, this brings us back to me, the loudest and most insistent proponent of the argument that soldier mindset is not actually a good thing. Um, to explain my perspective on this topic, I have to first introduce you to another concept, which you will probably be expecting, given the title of this talk. It is the scout. So the soldier's job is to attack and defend. The scout's job is to go out and get as accurate a map of the landscape as possible. And the scout may hope to learn that, for example, there's a bridge conveniently located where they need to cross the river. But above all, the scout just wants to know what's actually there, what's actually true. So if you're in scout mindset, you may hope that you know, your business is succeeding, or that you weren't at fault in a screw-up at work, or that you're making a good impression on your dates. But above all, even stronger than those hopes is a motivation to just know whatever is actually true, rather than deceive yourself into believing something that you want to be true. And my argument is that, relative to our default, we would be better off with less soldier mindset and more scout mindset. So the concept that scout mindset maps onto in the cognitive science literature is accuracy-motivated cognition, or reasoning. Um, reasoning where you're genuinely trying to figure out the truth, as opposed to directionally motivated reasoning. The study of scout mindset is pretty new. Um, most of the research so far in this area is focused on proving the existence of soldier mindset. But you can actually learn a lot about how scout mindset works by looking at the exceptions to the rule in the studies of soldier mindset, because there are almost always exceptions. So for example, you might have heard of a book called Super Forecasting by a political scientist named Phil Tetlock. The origin of this book was Tetlock's research showing that people, including so-called experts in political or economic forecasting, were, as Tetlock put it, roughly as accurate as a dart-throwing chimpanzee. They're overconfident, they're oversimplistic, they don't learn because they won't admit when they were mistaken, but there were exceptions. There was a small subset of almost entirely amateurs in Tetlock's study 
who actually were good at forecasting, so much so that they beat professional intelligence analysts who had access to classified data about the world. Um, and the, the amateur forecasters in Tetlock's group just had Google when they wanted to learn about something and they had no relevant background. They were just really good forecasters. So Tetlock called them the super forecasters and wrote this book about what were they doing right. And a lot of it is scout mindset. They were willing to acknowledge when they had been mistaken um, instead of rationalizing why they were almost right or they should have been right. They weren't that invested in any single ideology, so they sought out news from lots of different perspectives. Above all, they were just motivated to be accurate, more than they were motivated to defend a particular idea that they were attached to or that they had said in the past. You can find Scott Mindset popping up in very different domains. This is a great book called Deep Survival, Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why, by um, Lawrence Gonzalez, in which he examines hundreds of cases of people who got stranded after hiking or after a plane crash or shipwreck. And his conclusion is that 90% of people don't make it. Um, partly due to bad luck, of course, but also due to what I would call soldier mindset. Um, they convince themselves they're going to be rescued so they don't you know, conserve rations or struggle to you know, construct shelter. Or often they never prepare for disaster in the first place out of a kind of, if I don't think about it, it won't happen superstition. So they don't br bring along proper equipment um, or extra water in case of a shipwreck or educate themselves about the hazards of the area where they're hiking. That's 90% of people, but then there are the exceptions. Among the 10% who do survive, Gonzalez sees this common thread running through their cases. They're the ones who take precautions in advance, who accept early on that rescuers might never find them and that they might be in for a long struggle to survive. They have an accurate picture of their abilities. They don't overestimate their capabilities. They don't underestimate. Gonzalez says the first rule of the survivors is face reality. So you might have heard this different metaphor um, that's kind of similar to sol the soldier and the scout, which is the lawyer and the judge. Um, there's some similarities, right? Like lawyers are arguing for one side. The judge's role is to figure out which side is more deserving and be objective. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about why I like the scout metaphor and why I think it sort of adds important value to the concept. Um, the scout metaphor emphasizes the usefulness of having accurate beliefs. For the scout, the whole point of the accurate map is so that he can use it to navigate the world better. The whole reason that you should want to know about your strengths and weaknesses or whether your business plan is solid or whether you were at fault is so you can make better decisions going forward. And I think this is still true even when it isn't obvious how having an accurate map is going to benefit you. Um, I think it generally pays off in the long run indirectly. For example, I have a friend who I will call Bob who was homeschooled and his family raised him to believe in a bunch of supernatural things like astral projection, um, energy healing, mind reading, things like that. So Bob grew up believing in all of these things. And then one day in his 20s, after having encountered a bunch of skeptics, he decided to research it for himself. And to his surprise, you know, he had always assumed that there, would be, there was out there good evidence of things like astral projection. Um, but all of the stories that he had heard about you know, people correctly reporting objects in other rooms because they were projecting turned out to be inflated or hearsay. So that was like a thread he started pulling on and over the course of about a year it began to unravel all of the other supernatural beliefs. Now Bob was not seeking any particular benefit from this investigation other than just the satisfaction of knowing what was true. But nevertheless, I think the investigation did benefit him. For one thing, he now spends less time on supernatural interventions and more time on other things that have a better chance of working. Um, but there's this higher order benefit too. You know, having investigated one pillar of non-scientific claims and seeing it crumble under scrutiny, Bob became a little bit more skeptical of other claims that contradicted sort of solid established science. Which isn't to say that every single claim that contradicts the scientific consensus is necessarily wrong, but there's like some appropriate level of skepticism to apply to claims that contradict science and it's higher than what Bob had been applying. Um, and so what that means is that Bob is now a little bit better equipped to get the right answer in other domains, like health or psychology. He's a little bit less likely to waste his time on a medical therapy that you know, isn't gonna work or fall for a scam. And that's a real benefit to Bob having an accurate map of this issue, even though Bob never set out thinking, I'm going to investigate astral projection because I wanna improve my health. But I still haven't addressed the question, the arguments that I showed you a few minutes ago 
um, about the benefits of positive illusions and strategically false beliefs. So let me do that. I'll start with the positive psychology argument that soldier mindset is good for your mood and motivation, it boosts your morale, positive illusions are good for you. There are a lot of problems with the positive illusions literature, um, but probably the biggest is that it isn't about positive illusions. The standard approach in this field is to simply compare people's perceptions of themselves to averages. So for example, here's one of the tests that is commonly used in papers about the benefits of positive illusions. People are asked to rate themselves relative to their peers on traits like being intellectually self-confident, being anxious, being cheerful, being lazy, being uh, socially self-confident. And if you rate yourself as being even a little better than your peers on any of these metrics, you are counted as self-enhancing or holding an unrealistically positive self-image. But of course, for any trait, a lot of people are better than average. And the researchers don't make any effort to check whether you are in fact more cheerful or more academically able than your peers. The mere fact that you think you are is assumed to be a positive illusion. <laughs> then the researchers look at consequences of positive illusions. For example, in one study, they check uh, people for their re reactions to stress, and they find that self-enhancers are better at dealing with stress. But since we have no reason to doubt the reports of most of these alleged self-enhancers, all that we've shown is that people who report being more cheerful than average and less anxious than average tend to deal better with stress. This is not surprising. There is zero need to explain this result with convoluted logic like people who report being less anxious are self-deceiving and that self-deception makes them less stressed. This is the standard approach. Other measures of positive illusions don't even ask for a comparison to an average. They just ask you questions like, you know, how much do you agree with the statement, on the whole, I am satisfied with myself? And if you score highly, or you, know, you give a high answer to that, you're a self-enhancer. And then they show that people who score highly on these metrics also score well on tests of mental health and conclude that self-enhancement causes mental health. If you're thinking, I can't believe the psychology liter literature is that bad, I thought the same thing. I thought I must be missing something. But no, there are other researchers making this point, saying, you know, guys, your papers aren't actually measuring positive illusions. But those papers are not nearly as widely cited as the papers making the errors in the first place. It's really frustrating, guys. I just... <laughs> I'm going to show you one last metric of self-deception, because um, it's just hilarious. So uh, in this paper, which this metric has been used by several papers, but not as many as the others, they ask questions like, does every attractive person of the opposite sex turn you on? Do you ever feel attracted to people of the same sex? Have you ever wanted to rape or be raped by someone? And you're supposed to answer from one, meaning not at all, to seven, very much so. And if you answer with a one or a two, that counts as self-deception. So if you have never wanted to rape or be raped, or even if you have rarely wanted to rape or be raped, you're a self-deceiver. I just, I know I said this is hilarious, and it is, but it also just makes me genuinely angry like how bad this stuff is and how widely it's cited. I just, I can't even, I have to move on. All right, let's talk instead about the evolutionary psychology argument. The soldier mindset helps you persuade other people that you're correct and competent and so on. So my take in brief is that overconfidence, being falsely confident that you're right or that you're skilled or whatever, can be effective. Um, how much so depends on a few things. First, how sophisticated is your audience? If your audience doesn't have a good intuition for what is a reasonable claim um, in that domain in particular, you can get away with a lot more exaggeration. So let's say you're a consultant and you confidently tell a potential client, all the advice I've given my past clients has worked out extremely well. They're all much more successful than they were before, thanks to me. You definitely won't regret hiring me. Well, if your client is not that sophisticated, he might be super impressed by that. If your client is more sophisticated, he's likely to think to himself, really? All of her past clients are more successful? That seems implausible since, you know, it's hard to make business decisions and there's a lot of luck involved. This consultant seems kind of delusional. So part of the strategic calculus about scout versus soldier mindset for persuasion boils down to how sophisticated is your audience? Um, and do you care more about being persuasive to sophisticated people or unsophisticated people? Um, and I'm, I'm using that term specifically to mean sort of sophistication about reasoning in a particular domain. <clears throat> then there's the question of, does your audience have an incentive to figure out if you're right? 
You know, if you're a financial advisor to someone, for example, they definitely have an interest in trying to figure out if you're being overconfident because it's their money at stake. But on the other hand, if you're a talk show host, uh, your fans are probably not that interested in double checking your claims to find out if you're uncharitably misrepresenting the politician they hate. And finally, how obvious is it going to be if you are actually wrong? If you make overconfident predictions about, say, tomorrow's weather, um, it becomes quickly clear that you are overconfident. But if you say overconfident things about the far future, it won't become clear you were wrong in people's lifetimes. So basically, the ideal career choice, um, if you want to be overconfident, is to be a guru for an unsophisticated audience telling them that they're going to have the best afterlife. <clears throat> Just saying. I also think it's worth noting the advantages that Scout Mindset has in being persuasive. So this is one of, in my opinion, the most impressive acts of persuasion in history. Charles Darwin's book, On the Origin of Species an account of how species evolved through natural selection. It was a controversial bombshell when it was published in the 1860s, as Darwin knew it would be. The theory of evolution threatened the sacred, unviable worldview in which species were immutable and organized into a designed hierarchy with humans at the top. Darwin told a friend while he was preparing the book that arguing for evolution felt like confessing a murder. So the book sparked years of furious and often emotional debate, but Darwin's case was so solid so full of years of carefully collected observations and well-reasoned arguments that it ended up persuading people. Within a decade, the majority of the scientific establishment believed in evolution. And the reason that Darwin's case was so convincing, even to an audience with a strong bias against it, was that Darwin had scout mindset. He bent over backwards while writing the book to notice arguments and evidence that went against his theory. He followed what he called a golden rule of research to fight against motiv motivated reasoning. I had also, he wrote, during many years followed a golden rule, namely that whenever a published fact, a new observation, or a thought came over me, which was opposed to my general results, to make a memorandum of it, without fail and at once, because I had found by experience that such facts and thoughts were far more apt to escape from the memory than favorable ones. So Darwin basically stress-tested his theory for years within an inch of its life, trying to notice all of the potential objections to it and modifying and improving the theory until it was really solid. And that's what made him so persuasive. If he had instead tried to just convince himself that he was totally right and you know, win the day by the power of confidence, I don't think he would have succeeded. So basically, I think of overconfidence as a crutch. It might help you in some situations, for sure, but if you don't allow yourself to indulge in it, then you force yourself to become actually competent you force yourself to improve your theories until they're actually solid, and that works better in the long run. There's a book called Confidence by uh, Tomas Chamorro Pramuzic that makes basically this point. He says, we mostly have been brainwashed into thinking that confidence will eventually cause competence. I think it's much more appropriate to think of confidence as a compensatory strategy for lower competence. And by the way, it's funny to read reviews of this book on Amazon um, because it's, it's called Confidence. And there are all these reviewers who are like, one star, I bought this book because I wanted to learn how to be confident. And the author's whole point is like, no, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> so they were really disappointed. <laughs> so I think if you want to be influential and persuasive, which is a fine thing to want to be, then in addition to actually developing your skill, you should look for other ways to be charismatic and persuasive that don't come at the cost of damaging your mental models of the world. Like, improve your posture and your speaking voice, your general presentation, learn good social skills, expand your social comfort zone through practice. Interestingly, I just came across a paper called When Overconfidence is Revealed to Others, Testing the Status Enhancement Theory of Overconfidence by Anderson et al. And from the abstract, it seems to be making the case that overconfidence is useful that it makes you um, influential and higher status. Um, and to be clear, it's measuring actual overconfidence, like relative to your performance on tests, not some bullshit metric that gets called overconfidence merely if you claim to be good at something. Sorry, I'm still mad about that. Um, <laughs> but if you actually read the paper, there's a striking table of the factors that increase people's social status in these groups. And the actual measures of overconfidence, per se, like how confident you said you were in your claims, um, how easy you claimed the task was for you, and how competent you claimed to be, those are the highlighted ones at the bottom, they were either not significant or barely significant. The things that mattered, the things that increased your status in the group, were the social things. 
Did you participate a lot in the conversations? Was your tone of voice confident? Did you seem relaxed and at ease? And maybe you know, it could well be the case that being overconfident in your beliefs or your skills is one mechanism that causes those traits. But it's certainly not the only one. And it seems much better to me to just develop those skills directly rather than trying to deceive yourself into believing you're totally right and awesome in order to get social confidence as a side effect. All right, here's an argument that people sometimes make to me. They say, let's get the best of both worlds. Let's turn on soldier mindset sometimes when it's useful, like be in scout mindset when you're picking a business plan, but then once you've picked it, turn on soldier mindset and believe it's definitely going to succeed. Um, or you know, be in soldier mindset when you need to persuade people and scout mindset when you need to make tough decisions. Here's why I'm somewhat skeptical of that approach. When President Lyndon Johnson was a senator, he had this ritual that his aides called working up. So he would start with something he wanted to believe, something that would be convenient for him to believe, and then he would repeat it to himself again and again and again, willing himself to believe it. By the time he was done, he was able to argue that position with utter conviction and insist, apparently in earnest, that he had never believed anything different. And it was effective. People called him the greatest salesman one-on-one -on -one who ever lived. But the question is, could he switch into scout mindset when he had to make tough decisions, not just persuade people? He certainly tried to. So when he assumed the presidency and inherited the Vietnam War from Kennedy, he put together a group of advisors to give him multiple informed perspectives on what to do. Sounds like scout mindset. Um, the problem, though, was that even though he believed in theory that it was good to be open-minded and hear dissenting opinions, he really hated doing it. He was not good at the skill of hearing disagreement well or dealing with difficult or inconvenient truths. He would get angry at people who said things that he didn't want to hear, like, we can't win in Vietnam, we need to pull out. So his advisors would either learn to bite their tongues or he would start to exclude them from meetings um, or from the administration if he didn't like their opinions. The real wake-up call to Johnson should have been when his Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, finally changed his mind about the war. This was a man who had been a loyal member of the Johnson's administration, of the president's inner circle, um, a man who Johnson respected, um, who had been pro-war for years and then had reluctantly come to the conclusion that war simply wasn't working. When someone like that begins to voice doubts about your plan, that should prompt some genuine soul-searching. Instead, it only made Johnson angry. Historian David Halberstam wrote about McNamara's dissent, quote, the president still described his defense secretary as brilliant, but there was a new sarcastic touch to it. In mid-1967, when McNamara proposed limiting the bombing, gradually reducing it in scale as a means of getting negotiations started, Johnson took the proposals, handed them to an aide, and said, you've never seen such a lot of shit. By the way, it is amusing to compare this account of the event to Johnson's account in his memoir. He says, I studied McNamara's memo carefully. He made a cogent case for the actions he proposed. Though I disagreed with some arguments and questioned some assumptions, I was convinced that his proposal deserved thoughtful attention. Uh, a few months later, Johnson kicked McNamara out of the administration without warning. Um, he announced it in public, and McNamara had to pretend not to be surprised, uh, and the war raged on. So Johnson basically thought he was doing the scout mindset thing, he thought he was doing the like careful deliberation, open-minded, hear out dissenting opinions thing, um, but he just like was not suited to it. Of course, Johnson is just an N of one. He's an anecdote. Um, the question of how easy is it to switch back and forth between soldier and scout mindsets is an open empirical question. Um, and I am trying to have scout mindset about how broadly valuable scout mindset is. So it is totally possible that more research could change my mind about this. But I want to explain why it seems to me just a priori like it would be difficult to do the switching between modes thing. I'll use an analogy. When you're driving on an icy road and your car starts to skid, your reflex is to hit the brakes. But that's exactly the wrong thing to do. Uh, it only makes your car spin faster out of control. What you're supposed to do instead is to steer into the skid. Um, turn the steering wheel of the car in the same direction as the back end of the car is spinning. It's a really tough thing to remember on the spot because A, it's so counterintuitive, um, and B, your adrenaline is pumping and you have to do something fast. So really, the only way to do it reliably is through practice. And soldier mindset is also a reflex, a set of related reflexes, really. Um, rationalizing, defending, uh, dismissing, feeling resentful or offended when people disagree. So soldier mindset, I see it as like 
slamming the brakes when you start to skid. It's this thing you do reflexively, even though it's counterproductive in the long run, or the very short run when it's a car. Um, and then scout mindset is this other set of habits or reflexes that can sometimes override the soldier reflexes if you've practiced them, like considering a counter argument or remembering not to be defensive or checking yourself for bias um, or like questioning your first impression. And they're a little counterintuitive, they're a little bit unnatural um, and they're harder to do when your adrenaline is high, um, when you're you know, upset or aroused. Um, so if you rarely practice them, just like steering into the skid, it's gonna be really hard to just whip them out and do them reliably when you need to. Now, I know I've been disagreeing with the evolutionary psychologists, um, but I'm actually really grateful to them for highlighting the importance of incentives and reasoning, um, for asking like, what is the goal of the organism uh, when it's using its brain? This is something that's so often ignored. Uh, all too often, people talk about informing the public or improving education as solutions to our problems. And I just don't think that's gonna help that much. You know, we try lecturing kids about logical reasoning or, you know, checking claims that you find on the internet, considering alternative hypotheses, uh, but that may increase their ability to be accurate, but it doesn't increase their incentive to be accurate, right? You know, if there's no payoff from getting the right answer, either a material payoff or a social payoff or an emotional payoff, why should they bother expending the effort to do so? On the flip side, if they still face the same incentives to reach a particular conclusion, you know, to signal loyalty to their tribe or to look strong, to look consistent, and so on, then they're gonna continue to pursue those incentives no matter how much knowledge and information we give them about you know, the correct answers or the correct way to reason. So this is not a problem we can educate our way out of. Just to remind you, the graph of despair. <clears throat> I'm more optimistic about approaches that actually affect those incentives. Prediction markets, for example, like Predictit, are a way to offer people rewards for getting the right answer instead of just defending whatever you know, makes them look good or feel good. And the Long Now Foundation was actually ahead of the game. Way back in, I think, 2003, 15 years ago, they created long bets so that people could put their money where their mouth was when talking about the future. I want to see more things like this. Um, those are material incentives, but social approval and attention are also really powerful incentives. Uh, one culture that gets this right is actually a forum on Reddit, uh, which might surprise you because Reddit is not known for being a, you know, <laughs> oasis of scout mindset, but um, the subreddit <laughs> is. It's called Change My View, and it was created in 2013 by Carl Turnbull, who was then just a high school student. Uh, as of now, they have over half a million subscribers and our Change My View does what it says on the tin. People come to the forum with a view that they are at least open to changing, um, and other people argue with them. Perhaps the most unique aspect of Change My View is the delta system. So when you make an argument that the, like if someone else has submitted an argument and you respond to them uh, and the submitter finds your response convincing and it changes their mind even a little bit, like you know this, this one premise of my argument is like less solid than I thought, or hmm, that's like an alternate perspective that I hadn't considered, it's interesting. Anything like that, anything that alters their perspective a little bit, they can choose to award you a delta. It's just a little triangle-shaped icon um, that goes next to your username, signifying that you changed their mind. Um, and as you rack up deltas, your total count is displayed next to your name whenever you post. And people really want to earn deltas. <laughs> Technically, they're just made up, they mean nothing, but on the other hand, so are points in a video game, and people you know, really want to earn those. Deltas are a manifestation of your reputation on Change My View. Um, they make people more likely to respect you, to pay attention to you, to read what you say. Um, and one interesting result of the Delta system is that the best practices for mind changing rise to people's attention and spread throughout the Change My View community. Um, so as new members join the subreddit, they notice hey, I'm not earning as many deltas as I'd like to or as other people are. Um, what are those other people doing right? And so they study you know, the high delta earners' comments and arguments and copy what they're doing. So for example, top delta earners are less combative in their disagreements. Um, they're more likely also to ask clarifying questions before trying to argue with someone. And other members, especially new members, notice these behaviors Notice they're successful at earning deltas, copy them, and then the practices spread. This is kind of similar to what the open science community is doing. 
So I mentioned earlier in the talk um, how scientists are motivated to get results that are significant that they can publish. Um, this has been a simmering problem for many decades that just recently boiled over in the social sciences especially in what's been termed the replication crisis. So tons of seemingly solid findings that people had trusted for years uh, turned out not to be real, not to replicate when people tried to do the same experiments. Uh, so this is depressing, but there are a bunch of scientists who are trying to fix the problem, and they're pretty savvy about getting the incentives right, I think. For example, these are badges, open science badges, and they work kind of like deltas. Um, you get awarded a badge if you share your data from your experiment, um, if you pre-register your experiments, which, ma which makes it much harder to you know, fiddle with the data and make a bunch of little choices to get a result that you want. And they're also changing the social incentives more directly. So people who do rigorous things like share their data or acknowledge when they were wrong, get a, t a flood of social approval on uh, social science Twitter. And also, I mean, that's like the carrot, then the stick is people who are kind of slippery or sketchy about their uh, papers, you know, who like refuse to admit that their result didn't replicate or who, you know, have been shown to be p-hacking, to be like fiddling with their data. Um, they get social disapproval now in a way that they didn't before. Uh, and I think the internet helps with this, but it's also just the result of this concerted movement on the part of the people who care about improving the epistemics of science to make sure they're applying social pressure in the right ways. Uh, so it's slowly becoming more desirable, more incentivized to try to actually do good science and not just get your papers published. Before I wrap up, we're here with the Long Now Foundation uh, thinking about our long-term future and I wanted to say a few words about how soldier and scout mindset are in play in thinking about the future. So one thing that you'll notice if you pay attention to conversations about our future is that there are self-proclaimed optimists and then pessimists, who sometimes call themselves cynics or realists. And both groups wave their label as if it's a flag. Self-described optimists pride themselves on seeing the good in the world and on being enthusiastic and likable. Self-described cynics pride themselves on not being dupes and on facing hard truths. Optimists and cynics might not be official political parties, but they share a disdain for each other that rivals the mutual disdain between Republicans and Democrats. Optimists talking about pessimists use words like doomsayer, alarmist, shrill, paranoid, and chicken little, as in the sky is falling. Uh, and then in turn, pessimists talking about optimists use words like Pollyanna, naive, deluded, or pangloss who's the character in Voltaire's Candide, um, who provided comic relief by stubbornly insisting that this was the best of all possible worlds, even as great tragedy happened around him. And both sides feel like the embattled minority. Both optimists and pessimists view their own position as the more difficult and demanding and demonstrative of strength of character. So cynics or pessimists will say things like, the perennially naive optimist wants to be liked by all and offend none. This is a quote. Um, meanwhile, optimists say things like, despite how easy it would be to choose cynicism, I choose to believe in humanity's inherent goodness, or it's far too easy to be negative about everything. Incidentally, have you noticed that optimists often talk with pride about how they choose to be optimists, or how they identify as optimists? It's an interesting wording. Like, you wouldn't say, I choose to believe that the store is open, or I identify as someone who believes that the store is open. You would just say, the store is open. Um, my point is uh, that if people had no identity invested in being optimistic, they wouldn't say, like, I choose to believe that things turn out well or identify as someone who believes things turn out well. They would just say things tend to turn out well. So I think that when we talk about whether we're optimistic or pessimistic about the future, a lot of the time, to a large extent, we're not talking about how we think the world works. We're not talking about, you know, what does the landscape look like? What should we put on our map in order to be accurate? We're talking about what kind of people we are and what we value. It's a perfect storm for soldier mindset. And it really is important, I think, to be able to think honestly and accurately to the best of our abilities about the future. Questions like, what is the risk of a nuclear war? Is climate change something we could fix with technology? Um, is globalization making the world better? These are empirical questions, and it matters whether our guesses are roughly accurate or not. You know, if we are too sanguine about the risk of a catastrophe, um, that's definitely bad. On the other hand, if we underestimate the positive benefits of something, then we might never try it and not reap those benefits. 
So I'm sure you've all been paying rapt attention this whole time, but I'm just going to recap briefly uh, before I end my talk. So to recap, we are robots, <laughs> but we can rebel. Our brains are built to treat important questions as tribal fights or as threats to our ego or status. But we can change that. <coughs> Education doesn't help because of the graph of despair. <laughs> Having an, oh, we need to be incentivized to be accurate. Having an accurate map of the world is useful, and it doesn't mean you can't have morale and status. And finally, some psychology papers are really bad. Just so bad, you guys. Thank you. It sounded like you might have a little more to say at the end there. Was that interesting? I always have more to say. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, since one of the measures of Scout mindset, which you must have mastered by now, um, is uh, changing one's mind. Uh, of course, the obvious question is you must have gotten it before. What have you changed your mind about? Uh, Particularly in this realm, but any realm really counts. Um, I mean, I've definitely changed my mind about aspects of scout mindset. Mm -hmm. um, I, well, so I've been working on this book about basically what I discussed in the talk. And, uh, and it was really hard, especially at first, for me to, um, you know, I've been doing interviews with people who start companies or, you know, who are doing all sorts of things, just trying to understand how scout and soldier mindset works for them. And I, I noticed that I was really reluctant to interview people who I thought were going to disagree with my thesis and talk about, you know, how it was great to be super overconfident and how you have to, you know, never think about any doubts and things like that. Um, so I would avoid interviewing those people, or, or when I did interview them, I would I noticed myself asking them like leading questions, like, you know, so tell me about a time when change your mind was really useful, or tell. Me, and I wouldn't ask the questions like, uh, you know, have you found any downsides to like facing the truth, or like have you found overconfidence to be useful, or things like that. Um, so I I had to do kind of an intervention on myself. Uh, you know, in the talk. Self intervention, how does that work? Yeah. Well, so this is a whole thing I, I considered talking about in the talk and just decided to cut it for time. But I talked about incentives at the end. Um, I talked about mostly external incentives, like being financially rewarded for, your, for getting the right answer or being rewarded with social attention and approval, things like that. But internal incentives, as I call them, are, are also extremely powerful, uh, like feeling you know, curious or excited to learn things, um, like my friend Bob did in, in the story about supernatural beliefs, um, or in the opposite direction, feeling, uh, you know, stressed out or, or uncomfortable with possibilities. And so I think a lot of the, uh, like as an individual wanting to improve, boost your levels of scout mindset as opposed to someone designing systems in society or, you know, subcultures, I think one of the best and easiest things you can do is just try to change your internal incentives. So that was what I was trying to do um, in my investigation of scout mindset. Uh, so basically, the thing that I usually do is I ask myself, like, before, I'm, before I try to think about whether some inconvenient possibility is true, I try to uh, just say, OK, suppose it is true. Um, what then? Like, what happens then? Um, so like if I were you know, considering whether or not I had to fire someone and I was really stressed out about it and tempted to like rationalize why I didn't have to fire them. You had uh, employees? Uh, not anymore. Okay. <laughs> I fired them all. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> so um, in this case, the thing that I was worried about was that people were gonna tell me that overconfidence was really useful for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, okay, what if that is true? Uh, what if that turns out to be true? What then? Um, and I was like, well, it's not like it would sink my book. Like, A, I can allow exceptions. You know, my book doesn't have to claim that scout mindset is always correct. Um, and B, I can disagree with them. Like, the fact that some people might think that scout mindset is not as useful as I think it is doesn't, you know. Basically, every interesting book has had people disagreeing with it. Uh, it's like almost no exceptions. So uh, that... That was like a, a useful thing to think about, mm -hmm. and it made me much more sanguine about asking people non-leading questions 
uh, and facing the possibility of getting answers that I might not like. Uh, I guess the thing I want to say is just that there's a difference between having preferences about what is true and being unable to tolerate something being the case. Um, and so the purpose of interventions like this is to move yourself from like being unable to face a world in which it is true that whatever, like, you know, people disagree with me, um, versus a world in which like, well, that's not what I wanted, but like, I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I think that's a, a really valuable intervention to boost scout mindset. And so in answer to your original question, which I almost completely failed to answer, uh, the, the thing that I changed my mind about was just like, how, how often people at least perceive it to be the case mm -hmm. that overconfidence is helpful to them. And I, I've, you know, I have my thoughts, some of which I shared in the talk, about why I think they might be wrong or misperceiving things, or why there might be other better ways to get the things that they think they're getting from overconfidence, but, uh, but I certainly acknowledge now that uh, overconfidence is more popular than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, related to that is a good question from Bob Kopak who asks, do people vote for scouts or soldiers? Sorry, did you say, do people vote? For scouts or <clears throat> for soldiers? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, a lot of the difficulty in answering questions about, like, are scouts or soldiers more successful in you know, mm. business or politics or whatever, is that there aren't really that many scouts. So, I mean, I use the phrases scouts and soldiers often just kind of as a shortcut figure of speech. It's not like some people are scouts and some people are soldiers. It's a spectrum and we all have varying degrees of scout and soldier mindset and it changes from day to day or depending on what domain we're thinking about. Um, but, but there aren't that many people who are like shining exemplars of scout mindset and so. Well, let me raise one and, and see how it plays here. Okay. Which is um, most politicians that I've been, you know, watched uh, tend to say, well, as I've always said, <laughs> and then they repeat some notion they have. Um, I worked for Jerry Brown during his first administration. Oh. And I you know, stayed friends in his second administration. One of the peculiarities of Jerry Brown, which I think he learned from um, Jesuits that he trained with in the Vichyot, and the whole idea of the devil's advocate being taken seriously, mm -hmm. uh, as I saw in person, uh, sometimes to my discomfort, Jerry taking the opposing argument to the obvious thing that should be decided, you know, huh. would come to his desk, and he would just uh, defend the other view, <clears throat> or go out and find somebody who would defend the other view. So for example, there was a California Metrication Council, and he knew I was against the total conversion to metric, so he put me on the California Metrication Council. Mm -hmm. uh, and thanks to Ronald Reagan, I was successful, and we did not totally. <laughs> change. Um, and he let it be known that he would occasionally change his mind. Or he would say things like, you know, I don't think the debate is really mature on this subject yet, and let's see how it plays out a little longer. We're not in a hurry to make a decision on this. Because what comes to a governor or a president's desk is basically unsolvable problems. All the solvable ones get dealt with in yeah. other levels of government. And um, and he did not get punished for that uh, in the you know in, in the voting. And uh, you know he doesn't he's not long on charm. He's pretty good on charisma. Um, and he's tricky. You don't know what the hell he's talking about sometimes. Uh, and sometimes he's figuring it out. You know, in person in front of you. So all of this is not classic soldier behavior at all. Yeah. And yet he did okay. And yet he's also pretty rare. I think. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are exceptions um, in both successful and unsuccessful politicians. So, like, one person who comes to mind, I think it was Barry Goldwater, um, hmm. who, he was not a super successful politician, um, but he uh, defended Bill Clinton when Clinton was being, he was under attack for, um, oh, which scandal was it? It wasn't the <laughs> <Lincoln. laughs> I'm blanking on which scandal. Maybe, sorry, did someone say something water? White water? Yes, white water. I think it was white water. Uh, and Good crowdsourcing. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and Goldwater was like, like called a press conference. So he's super conservative. He called a press conference just to say that people should lay off of Bill Clinton because it was, the evidence was not strong against him and you should just like let him do his job. And this is like scandalized a bunch of people and made him a bunch of enemies. 
Um, there are, I mean, I think Obama has given, like there are cases of Obama being pretty scout-like. Yeah. Um, he's talked about his process of writing speeches and said, you know, some people are most, some people are able to be compelling and convincing um, sort of no matter what they believe, like saying something that they don't necessarily believe. For me, it's much easier to give a compelling speech if I've like edited it until I feel like I can really stand behind it. Um, and he's sort of a pretty careful reasoner. Um, even, you know, Ronald Reagan sort of had, had more of the classic like, uh, like, like be charismatic and tell people what they, you know, what's gonna make them happy and things like that. But he also had some examples of scout mindset. He was a big fan of, uh, I think it was FDR's New Deal, mm -hmm. um, which is not like a classical thing for a conservative to be a fan of. Um, but he, he just grew up admiring FDR and he you know, would give interviews where he was like, you know what, FDR's really misunderstood and like, uh, you know, I disagree with him about some things, but he had all these admirable virtues. He really brought the country together and that was really great. Um, so, you know, there are examples, like, it's not impossible to be a successful politician and do some scout-like things. Uh, at that said, you know, when I was talking about the types of factors that make a difference in whether scout, or whether uh, overconfidence is going to be successful in persuading people, being a politician kind of checks a lot of those boxes. Like, the audience is not sophisticated, almost by definition, because it's just like the entire country. You know, it's not like a special set of, you know, experts. Um, people are not, I guess they're a little motivated to decide if you're, you know, telling lies or something, but with like tribalism, they're not that motivated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things you say, people will find out if they were true or not, maybe years later, maybe if anyone's paying attention. A lot of the things you say aren't, aren't even like testable predictions. They're just sort of like, Im like affective, expressions about the country or about people or things like that. So uh, I think politics is, is definitely a case where scout mindset is like less able to thrive. Well, maybe we can change that. Um, Bob Kopak also asks, can there be other players besides scouts and soldiers? And sort of speaking to your metaphor, that can you imagine generals and charismatic idiots and camp followers <laughs> and <laughs> priests and sages and you know, do you want to expand the the I mean, the, the kid in me who loves sci-fi and fantasy is getting very excited at having a richer <laughs> menagerie of characters. Um, I think, I mean, an important point that may not have been clear from the way I explained it in the talk is that uh, scout and soldier mindsets aren't like a mutually, uh, what's the word, let me see. Uh, exhaustive. Exhaustive, thank you, yes. Um, they don't exhaust the space of possible you know, ways you can be thinking. Mm -hmm. um, so here, here's an example. When I, I mentioned the case of someone like choosing a business plan and then uh, executing on it. So a lot of people will say like, well, you should try to be in soldier mindset mm -hmm. while you're executing on your plan if you can. Um, and I would say, no, the ideal, like you, it's true you don't want to be constantly questioning and second guessing yourself and, you know, reevaluating your core assumptions of your business because that would be, exhausting and you'd never get anything done. Um, but ideally what I think you should do is just decide, okay, I'm gonna be in execution mode for a while, maybe that's you know, a month or six months or what depends on your business and the stage you're at. Um, and if a doubt comes up or like if a, a concern or a piece of unfortunate evidence comes up, I'm gonna be like, okay, maybe, maybe that's a thing, maybe that's a concern, I'm not gonna think about it right now. Um, I'll like reevaluate later in the future. Um, and so, and then you do, you know, reevaluate later in the future. Maybe at some point, six months later, you're like, well, the accumulated concerns and flaws in the plan that have come up in the last six months now make me think that, you know, this might be a problem. Pivot but, or die, right? Yeah. The but, incentives are strong at that point. Right. But, but the key is that what you're doing is just like deciding not to make any decisions now mm -hmm. instead of the soldier mindset thing to do, which would be to find some reason why those concerns are false or, you know, or unwarranted or something like that, to like convince yourself that everything is definitely still great. <laughs> um, and I think that approach to dealing with potential flaws or obstacles that come up is just more damaging to your epistemic health. Some of that is situational. When I was 20 years in the Global Business Network where we were purveying scenario planning, 
which is a great way to get companies sort of out of the soldier mindset of this is our theory of the future and we're operating mm. the whole business in service of that theory and they get all kinds of confirmation bias and all the rest of it. What is so, situational planning? Um, I'm sorry? What is situational planning? Uh, well, what's situational is um, large companies really, really gain from scenario planning. Startups don't. Sort of because like here's the situation. A, a, a large company or a department of government or even a whole government in the case of Singapore uh, often has uh, sort of set itself in motion uh, with a theory of the world which is playing out very well, thank you. But the world keeps changing. And if they keep going with this same sort of strategic scheme, uh, they will not be alert to changes in the world and they will not figure that they're supposed to be alert and they're supposed to adapt to changes in the world because they have this huge success. And what scenario planning allows them to do is have more than one theory of the world. Mm. They get typically <coughs> four theories of the world, any of which might be right, they're totally plausible, but they imply completely different things that they might be facing in the next five, 10, 15 years. A startup has the theory of the world, mm -hmm. which uh, scenarios are not gonna help them, it's just gonna confuse them. Uh, <laughs> and that we found that we're not particularly useful to them because um, five or 10 years is, is a startup is just trying to get circuit with the world, just trying to get something that's feeding your incentive to keep going and to survive as a business or as a nonprofit or whatever. And so you're making a full bore bet on your theory of the world, which may or may not be right. Sometimes it's that the fact that it's a full bore well, bet will convince the world that there's something there. So this is part of the confidence thing. But anyway, uh, what I'm saying is situational about it is a small organization or an individual um, is maybe not gonna gain by scenario planning as much as a great big thing which has to, uh, which is gonna take 10 years to turn the ship. Mm. A small company can <coughs> pivot, a big company has a really tough time pivoting. I see. For example, see what I mean? So you're, uh, okay, let me make sure I understand. So you're saying that um, scenario planning is less useful to a startup mm -hmm. um, in part because situational planning is useful if uh, you can't just adapt to new situations when they happen, which mm -hmm. larger companies can't as mm -hmm. easily. Right. And also, I think you're saying uh, startups have less sort of attention and organizational capacity to spare mm -hmm. uh, and sort of all yeah. they can really That's do is addition. just like yeah. make their one bet yeah. uh, as opposed to a large company with lots of. And then also, you know, the cost of failure for a startup in most cases is much smaller than the cost of failure for a large organization. Just that's, you know, they, they have to minimize the regrets. Yeah. Um, again, in the, in the metaphors you're using, the, uh, actually Philip Tetlock you referred to has, has been in this series twice. Uh, one was about the super forecasting book. Oh, cool. And he uses Israel Berlin's um, Hedgehog and the Fox. The mm -hmm. Hedgehog has one big idea and the Fox has many ideas. Yeah. And he further, <coughs> you know, sort of plays it out further. The Hedgehogs are very persuasive because they know all the arguments for their particular thing. And the Fox is kind of tentative and, and not as good on television and, uh, and kind of, uh, you know, the super forecasters are all kind of dialing back the clarity of their statement because they're saying, you know, it, 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 I have to stay a little vague on this in order to be open for the nuances of why that mo might actually be occurring. So mm -hmm. to be accurate is to be a little fuzzy. And um, so you buy a lot from Tetlock, but do the hedgehog and foxes speak to you? Yeah, so there's two separate things going on here. I think one okay, is great. the... Uh, <laughs> Uh, one is the how tentative you sound, um, and that I think is uh, like yeah. you you can you can be bold and confident while still having nuanced models. So like for example, I have I, I have a friend who um, he, he he recounted the story to me. So he was he was talking to a friend of his. Um, I'll make the friend female just because it's easier pronouns. Okay, so. Uh, he was telling his friend about how it was important to be, you know, change your mind and update your beliefs and so on. And uh, the friend was like, what are you talking about? You never change your mind. And my friend was like, are you kidding? I change my mind all the time. In fact, there are two instances I can remember where I changed my mind with you 
in this, you know, like in the last month. And he explained them, and she was like, that's true, actually. You, you did change your mind. Why did that not register for me as examples of you changing your mind? Um, and she thought about it, and she was like, you know, I think it's because you were just so unfazed. Like, it didn't, you didn't seem sheepish. You didn't, you were just like, oh, yeah, that's right. I was wrong about that. And then you just went on. And so my mind didn't store it as an example of you having been wrong. Um, <laughs> and... And I, I know people, I know so other people like this. that's the pedagogic thing to do is say, wow, I was really wrong about that. Thank you so much. I mean, it's, you, you can do the like enthusiasm and gratitude for no, having, you know, been shown to be wrong. But a lot of this is just extremely nonchalant. Like, oh yeah, I was wrong about that. You know, now I think X instead of Y or something. Which and suggests it, sort of we didn't have a strong opinion in the first place. Which no, I think, here's what I think it suggests. I think it suggests that, well, sorry it probably suggests that it wasn't like an extremely weighty, emotionally fraught topic to you, that's true. Mm -hmm. um, but it might, you still might have had a confident belief about it, like been 90% sure that X mm -hmm. was true and then realized, oh wait, no, Y is true. I think the nonchalance is really helpful. It makes, mm. it makes changing your mind really easy and effortless mm -hmm. and frictionless. Yeah, and the, the source, I think, of that nonchalance is, I mean, I've, I've asked people about it um, who, who have this nonchalant approach um, and when I ask them questions like, why do you not feel sheepish when you change your mind? They tend to sort of look taken aback and then they shrug and they're like, well, I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> like, I am following the right process for, you know, forming beliefs and evolving them over time. And that ideal process, just by its very nature, it will involve like changing, like as you get new information or as you reevaluate old information, um, you will notice uh, things that you were wrong about. But that's you doing the right thing. That's not you having screwed up. I mean, sometimes it might, it might sometimes be you having screwed up. It might be that like in the past, you had all the information you needed to be right and you were just like refusing to see it or something like that. But most of the time when these people change their minds, like, no, I got new information. I like reevaluated. Now I think this other thing. And it's just like, they're just doing there the must process. There are things that are tougher to change my mind about because they imply a whole bunch of other mm. things. And so, so the, the cascade of oh my gosh, if I change my mind about climate, then I've got to be, become a Democrat. Or, yeah. You know, <laughs> and so yeah. if you perceive a cascade, that uh, potentially would make you cling to the uh, soldier point of view on something much more strongly, yes? Yeah, so I, a thing I believe that might sound surprising is that in most cases, it is actually f wrong to change your mind about a sort of fundamental belief, you know, in response to like one discussion or you know one mm -hmm. argument or something like that, Interesting. because, like, like if you're following the correct uh, intellectual process, this will almost never happen. Um, and, and you know, often maybe that's the result of soldier mindset. But even if you're doing everything right, it would not happen very often. The reason is, you know, our beliefs are all, as you were saying, they're all sort of connected to each other. Um, they're like this network of, of interconnected beliefs that are all kind of dependent on each other. And so, you know, something like climate change, um, there's a bunch of beliefs that are related to that. Like, let's say you don't believe climate change is real. Um, there's a bunch of related beliefs that that, that belief depends on, like uh, scientists are not that trustworthy or, um, or like other experts, maybe religious experts or, or other sources of authority are trustworthy. Or maybe uh, there's a belief about how common is it for conspiracy theories to happen? Because like a lot of people who don't believe that climate change is happening think that um, there's sort of a conspiracy among climate scientists to uh, to like say the false thing. Um, and so if you believe that conspiracies are, conspiracies are actually pretty common, then it's like more reasonable to believe that it could be the case that climate scientists are all covering this up. And so for you to justifiably change your mind about climate science, you would need to change your mind about a bunch of other things too. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that can almost never happen in one conversation. That's like, like even if you're doing everything right and you're like, you have scout mindset, that's a process that would take a long time. Okay, so related to that, Liz Voller asks, um, related to your suggestion that people not change their mind about important things based on a single conversation. Um, she asks, have you found a way to award deltas to people in real life in your own conversations <laughs> with them? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, well, 
this one is kind of silly, but in some groups of friends or like at the organization I used to work with, um, we just had this hand symbol that was like w wiggling fingers. It was just a sign, I'm not suggesting everyone do this, I'm just telling you, you asked, so. Um, <laughs> it was just a gesture of like approval, sometimes agreement, sometimes just like approval or, or you know, it was, it was just like a, you know, karma points or something like that. Um, and we would just do that whenever we noticed someone in conversation doing like an epistemically virtuous thing, uh, like, you know, acknowledging that someone else had a point or, um, or sometimes like phrasing their statements in a way that, that could be falsified. Like most of the things we say aren't precise enough that anyone could ever prove us wrong. Um, so if someone said like, you know, all like, like that's, that'll never work or something like that. And then it was like, okay, what I actually predict is that within two months, like revenue will be X, Y, Z or something. And we'd be like, okay, good. Testable prediction. <laughs> um, or like, I don't know, someone being willing to make a bet. Uh, these are all things that we make. It's just like, so you don't interrupt the conversation. Um, and it's, and, and like the hand gesture started to be infused with like positive affect because of the association. So you'd like actually feel good, sort of like with deltas. Um, I mean, in like real life, you should probably just like tell someone that you think it's cool that they did the thing. <laughs> but yeah. Clarity, transparency. Okay. I mean, you, sorry, you should also like be more willing to like share stuff online from people who do the good things. And you know, if you run a company or a team of people, like be more willing to reward people with like attention or promotions or things like that when they, you know, make accurate predictions or, you know, are willing to like say like, here are the potential downsides of my plan. Like, I think we should do it anyway, but I wanna like be intellectually honest and mm -hmm. not pretend that it has no downsides. Like those are the kinds of things you should be rewarding. Yeah, in science there's always the stories of, uh, one I knew was the economist Kenneth Farrell, who got the Nobel Prize, and he was part of the scene at Santa Fe Institute where um, basically, physicists got them going on adaptive modeling and so on, where they came up with the idea of bounded rationality and structural yeah. rationality in economics. And uh, Ken Arrow, at the end of the initial session that basically did this, said, uh, well, you guys have just overturned my entire body of theory, and I can't thank you enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, when the scientists do that, and it's rare, but when they do it, all other scientists go right on. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way to do it. So, you know, encouragement <coughs> helps, you're right, and add those incentives. I have so, a story about that, if yes, we have please, time for a story. Um, some people might have heard me say this before, because it's one of my favorite stories. Um, but, uh, so this was at, at Oxford in the zoology department in, I think, the 1970s. Um, and at the time, in the field of zoology, there was this uh, debate over the existence of this particular cellular structure called the Golgi apparatus. Mm. Um, the debate was, is it actually real or is it like an artifact, an illusion of measurement or observation? Mm. And there was this like elderly distinguished professor in the zoology department at Oxford whose position was it's not real, it's an artifact of observation. Um, and then one day this younger American professor visited Oxford and gave a talk to the department where he presented new and very compelling evidence that the Golgi apparatus was in fact real. And so throughout his talk, all the other scientists are kind of like looking over their shoulder at the <laughs> older professor like, what's he going to say? <laughs> How's he taking this? And at the end of the talk, the older professor strode up to the front of the lecture hall and extended his hand to the young professor and said, my dear sir, thank you. You've shown me that I've been wrong for 15 years. <laughs> and everyone burst into applause right. and cheers. Right. Um, and I still tear up when I think yeah, about it. Course, it's so cheers. beautiful. <laughs> That's an incentive, right? Yeah. Here. Make Julia cry. <laughs> so Kevin Kelly has a question. Uh, of course, Steven Pinker, he refers to, argues that a scout mindset would reveal that optimism is warranted because progress in the world is real. Um, what's your view on that? Um, I am... So... This is a complicated question um, because... Like, so Pinker's thesis, as I understand it, is um, everything's getting better. Uh, and to make that case, he points to these historical trend lines. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and I basically agree with that. Like, I, I agree the world has gotten better in a bunch of really important ways. Um, and, I'm, and I'm pretty optimistic about those trend lines continuing. So in that sense, yes, I'm like optimistic in the sense that like, my best trying to be accurate guess is that things are going to be good. Mm -hmm. um, the the like, area of nuance that I want to add, though, is that in my experience, Pinker uh, is really resistant to the argument that as things on average have gotten better, tail risks have also gone up. Like, as more powerful technology is created or is beginning to be created, um, as the world becomes more interconnected, um, the impact of catastrophes can get much bigger, you know, nuclear war or pandemics or things like that, and that these are like real risks that we should worry about. Uh, and I, my impression has been that like, Pinker is dismissive of these concerns because they don't fit with the general thesis that things are getting better. To my mind, those, are, those two things are completely consistent. Like, Things have gotten better and will continue to get better in a bunch of important ways. Also, risks are going up. Um, but yes, I, I mean, I am generally pretty optimistic uh, about the future um, because it seems warranted to me. I just, I just worry about the discourse around optimism where like, I, I often see people who are also optimistic for similar reasons as me, like praise optimism and uh, and condemn pessimism, and I think that's just the wrong way to be conducting a conversation. Like, you should be making the case for optimism, you shouldn't be saying yay optimists and boo pessimists, um, which could be effective, like it's totally a thing that people respond to social incentives, they don't want people to think they're a wet blanket or you know, annoying or a doomsayer or things like that, and so you can in fact like socially pressure people into having the views that you think they should have, but you shouldn't do that. You should just make your case and, you know, if you're right, you'll be more convincing to people. So. Um, Andy Lee asked, um, what shifts our mentality from soldier to scout? And um, <clears throat> maybe this would be a two-phase question. What is education sort of starting from Blank slate, not really, but uh, you know, young people. Uh, how would you encourage scoutness, or at least openness to scoutness, and not just completely buy into a soldier mentality? And then yeah. uh, later on, as happened with the guy who was educated at home with weird beliefs, uh, how does one change from from soldier to scout? Yeah. So there's two different ways you could address this question. One is um, over time, how do you shift someone's sort of disposition and general habits mm -hmm. in a scout-like direction, scout-word direction. Um, a different approach would be like in a given situation, like with my, you know, with my book where I was like flinching away from the possibility that people might disagree with me, how do you shift in a given situation towards a uh, scout mindset? Um, but I'll just, I, I already sort of talked about the latter one a little bit, um, but to focus on the former. Um, so I had this graph of despair in my talk um, there is a corresponding graph of partial hope that I, I could have shared as well. It's also from Kahan, um, and it's and it's also about like people's views on the question of is global warming happening. Um, but the x-axis, instead of being uh, science literacy, is science curiosity, um, which Kahan measures in a bunch of different ways. Um, partly self-reports from people, but also like how often do they go to science lectures? <laughs> how often do they read science books? Um, when you like give them a bunch of materials to read, do they read the science thing? Things like that. Um, and that graph is much less depressing um, because as people go up the percentile scale of uh, science curiosity, um, their views actually converge slightly, um, but they don't diverge wildly the way they did in the uh, science literacy graph. Mm -hmm. um, so like the more scientifically curious people are, the more likely they are to think that global warming is real. Um, even though Republicans are still less likely than Democrats. They're like going in the right direction. They're like moving together. Um, so, so then a question would be like, how do you encourage curiosity? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know a lot about that. Uh, I know that there are uh, pretty convincing theories about our, the, the way our sort of standard educational system is set up, um, like quashing curiosity, or squashing curiosity early. Uh, so to the extent that schools are doing that to kids, we could stop doing that, and that would probably be helpful. Um, but in terms of like taking an adult and making them more curious, it's, 
I don't know exactly how to do that. Well, one thing I saw in all places in officer training in the Army was, um, it turns out the function of an officer, at least for a small unit, probably at every scale, is um, you, have the, you have the unit doing the best it can at the mission that's been given and doing it the way it looks like probably the orders laid it out you're supposed to do and the sergeants and the troops are all wailing away doing this thing as good as they can. And the officer's job is to um, supervise that, see if in fact that's happening, but also in a sense to kind of jam his face, look the other way in terms of always asking the question, uh, is it possible that the unit is diligently doing the wrong thing well? Hmm. Uh. And because uh, it's so easy to judge, well, you know, that it's going well, and everybody's you know really bearing down, and getting uh, advancing. Uh, if it turns out to be in the wrong direction, right, uh, the wrong side of the hill, or there's not a sporting unit next to you like you thought there was, uh, that's the officer's job is to have that basically larger perspective, which mm -hmm. has a kind of a aggressive and creative doubt. It's almost Buddhist uh, that. You know, what if we're doing the wrong thing well? Hmm. Interesting. And, I should and, you know, introduce some it's training. officers. It's, you know, it's not even yeah. education. It's just, you know, this is how you do it. And then you know, go out and do it. And then they give you some things where you get a chance to sort of try that and realize it's basically true. Um, I think this is part of what good judgment. Winston Churchill was saying, you know, the main thing you look for in a hire or anything else or a politician, they have good judgment. Mm -hmm. And there's very few... There's very little, as near as I can tell, very few books about what is good judgment. How do you recognize good judgment in somebody? How do you hire for good judgment? How do you change bad judgment to good judgment, which mm -hmm. is part of what you're getting at? Um, and Peter Drucker always claimed that the main thing you look at is the track record of who, the person you're going to hire. And if they have a bunch of documentable successes, that's a pretty strong indication that they have the kind of judgment that would make the right thing keep happening. And you can hire for that and expect the right thing will keep happening. Anyway, that's the story so far. Yeah. So the, the question <coughs> I always ask is, where do you go next? What's next for you? I have to finish this freaking book. <laughs> <laughs> What's the book called? And um, the, the current working title is uh, The Soldier and the Scout, mm -hmm. Why We Deceive Ourselves and How to Get Things Right. Um, get things right, yes. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what stage are you at? Uh, I turned in the first draft. Mm -hmm. I'm waiting for my publisher to get back to me with edits. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, One thing I recommend on that is hire your own line editor. Unless uh, they oh, have a, okay. you know, and even when they have a really good line editor, get your own, because then you can, you got more choices. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I do have a couple other things that I've kind of been excited about and been putting off uh, as I've been writing the books, and maybe at some point in the near future. Um, one thing is uh, I've been focused mostly in the time I've spent thinking about thinking. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about individual reasoning and judgment, like how to use an individual to decide what information to collect and how to evaluate it and when to change your mind and so on. Um, and I've just gotten increasingly interested in group, group reasoning. Um, mm -hmm. what, how do you like assemble a group that's going to be uh, as accurate as possible? What kind of like norms do you have in the group? Um, Diversity, do you, does it really help? <clears throat> yeah, it's a mm -hmm. great question. Um, so if I were to write a book at some point in the future, I can't even think about that right now. Uh, it might be about group, group scout mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and then another thing that I got interested in while working on this book and arguing with it about friends is uh, soldier versus scout mindset in the history of science. Mm. So a, an argument that some of my friends uh, have made, I won't name them because I don't know if they don't want to be named, but uh, an argument some people have made is uh, science actually benefits a lot from soldier mindset. Mm -hmm. You want people to be these sort of uh, mavericks who have their own crazy theories that they pursue mm -hmm. and they don't listen to anyone tell them that you know, their theory doesn't make sense or that there are flaws. And you know, most of them are just going to be crazy people who I would, I would don't not do anything. Use the soldier metaphor for that kind of creature. Um, they, yeah, I mean, they isn't go to the stockade. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so yeah, so in this that, theory, exactly, yeah. right? You you like want people to just like not be at all interested in whether the theories are wrong, and that way we get this like 
big diverse exploration of the space of possible theories, which in this model we wouldn't get if everyone was like trying to be, you know, accurate and reasonable. I, I would love to see a history of science, basically of yeah. scientists uh, in that so, mode. So this is what I've sort of been doing in my free time uh, mm -hmm. when not working on the book. I well, so for a while between me and these friends, it was like a war of anecdotes where like he would like give an example of a scientist who was you know, not very scout mindset and like turned out to make a super important discovery. And I would respond with an example of a scientist like Darwin who had a lot of scout mindset and that was really valuable. Um, and then I was like, this is just, this war of anecdotes is not gonna settle anything. I need some more um, constrained way to like pick a representative or good subset of scientists uh, and then just like look at how much soldier scout like successful scientists who made valuable contributions. Great. Um, and then just like read their histories and how they, what their process was, how they discovered mm -hmm. the thing they discovered. So the thing I've started doing is going on Wikipedia and they have a list of um, paradigm shifts in various fields of science. Mm -hmm. um, so like uh, you know, Darwin's on there, uh, Newton, Lavoisier, um, you know, Einstein, and, and just reading about their process in as much detail as I can That's to great. figure out, you know, how how like intellectually honest were they, and and how much did it matter? And then That's a project I'm excited about. That is, I mean, the whole process of a paradigm shift is a social. Approach. Right. That's kind of amazing. Yeah. We're coming to the end, and there's a novelty coming up, which Julie has a cold, so she won't shake hands with anybody, including anybody who comes up afterwards. But she came up with an alternative for us to have for the handshake. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>